title of this video was fixing Star Trek, but that implies that it's like broken, which I don't think it is. Star Trek needs more of like a course correction to really get things banging on all cylinders. And to do that, I want to talk about a concept I have coined called franchise stewardship. <laughs> Upon initially hearing this statement, you might think I'm talking about returning to Roddenberry and the Berman era Star Trek and putting things back to the way they were in 2005. It's been a long road. But that isn't the case at all. Franchise stewardship goes beyond just managing Gene's vision for Star Trek. That's part of it for sure, but so is modernizing what the current target audience views as future technology and also exploring stories and ideas that can act as a commentary on the issues that we face today. And thus begins a delicate tightrope balancing act of keeping Star Trek relevant in this century, telling the stories that you want to, and also listening to feedback from Trekkies. A balancing act that even Gene himself knew all too well and had very definitive feelings on. And you cannot be a, a good producer, writer, or anything if, if, if you if you first thing you ask is, what do they want? That's what prostitutes do. I write what I think they should have and what I think they'll enjoy. What makes Star Trek good is a very subjective thing. Even when people consider canon within the franchise, it's usually very polarizing with often conflicting results. Check out this poll ran by myself and Lore Reloaded, simply asking if the new animated short trek should be considered alpha canon, and we received almost entirely opposite responses. Writing Star Trek to please the fans is never a good first step, as Gene himself said. But you need to listen to feedback while also taking ownership over your new role in developing the Star Trek franchise for the future. This idea of ownership was also something Gene felt very strongly about. Crew people you have who, who need encouragement, who need to have their thing. People don't just work for money. Uh, the mixers, the cameramen and all of those people have to have their show and with a new cast it could be that way uh, it could be have new ideas and so on uh, people the whole group could say as they say today it's our star trek i think it's safe to say that like gene's vision had some conflicting tenants like just baked right into it he says that new production teams need to feel ownership and essentially love for their part of the franchise they're working on while also limiting that to a very specific rule set for what he views as acceptable content within the Star Trek universe. This boundary is perfectly exemplified in an open letter Gene crafted to Harv Bennett about his concerns over what was happening within the Star Trek film The Wrath of Khan, saying, quote, With these kinds of revisions, I believe that the film will not be accepted as genuine Star Trek. And it should be sufficient to support my assertion that the script needs a considerable rewrite. The Wrath of Khan, of course, went on to become one of, if not the most popular Star Trek film to date. All of that is to say franchise stewardship extends beyond trying to just interpret Roddenberry's vision for Star Trek. Stewardship means you own it, now you've got to take good care of it which is something I don't think the current studio secret hideout being led by Alex Kurtzman or the Star Trek global franchise group led by Veronica Hart is doing particularly well. And no, I'm not talking about canon or redesigning the Klingons and all that stuff. I'm talking about fundamental processes that need a top to bottom overhaul in order to keep Star Trek more relevant and easier to understand by a modern audience. In my opinion, proper franchise stewardship can be broken down into three main areas, all of which currently need improvements. Communication and interaction, development roadmaps, and brand expansion. <laughs> Communication is critical when it comes to proper stewardship of any franchise, but especially one as beloved as the 50 plus year old Star Trek universe. Since the letter writing campaign that saved the original series back in the 60s, Trekkies have had like a 
deep connection to what is going on with the franchise, something that needs to be cultivated and respected. While Star Trek has done some work on this front by appearing at headlining convention halls like San Diego and New York Comic Con, the overall communication plan is a bit of a mess. Let's look at some examples of what I mean. Now, regardless of your feelings about the current state of Star Wars, Disney and Lucasfilm know how to properly set up and manage communications plans for their audience. Starting simply enough, Let's go to the official sites for both Trek and Wars and compare the two. Here, StarWars.com loads up and you're greeted with large scrolling images to pull your attention, quick links to different areas of the website, and a nice clean, sleek layout to let you know what website you're on. Now, on StarTrek.com, the first thing that happens is a half-page ad loads at the top for something not related to Star Trek at all. In this case, it's Best Buy? You have to scroll down to get the ad to stop taking up half of the entire window, and even then it stays at the top now no matter what. Viacom CBS is a billion dollar company, and they are running a half page persistent ad on their flagship franchise's official website. Okay. The website itself has a similar to feel of that of StarWars.com, and its layout is functional and easy to understand. However, again, the ad space at the top causes issues for trying to view videos that are embedded into the Star Trek website, as you can see here. Whether you are aware of it or not, this giant ass ad and the differences between the websites is communicating a message to you as the viewer. One of these franchises is to be taken seriously, and the other hopes that you're interested in a deal at Best Buy for some quick ad revenue. Now let's expand our critique into the social media aspects of communication. Again, we're going to be using Star Wars as a comparison. Star Wars maintains 10 primary Twitter accounts to communicate with fans all around the globe. Each one shares a standard looking Twitter bio photo, utilizes very specific Twitter header photos, and all of them are updated regularly. Switching over to the Star Wars YouTube channel, you can see now the same set of Twitter accounts also have YouTube accounts, which are all connected and listed under the Featured Channels tab. Again, each one shares similar bio photos and are updated regularly with the similar or exact same content. Instagram and Facebook have a similar breakdown, with key productions like The Mandalorian even having its own set of social media accounts dedicated to that particular show. The running theme here is cohesion. All the accounts are connected. They all use the same bio photos, similarly looking header photos, and are all updated regularly, usually with the exact same information across all platforms. This cohesion is communicating a very clear and specific message to you as the viewer. This is an official social media account for Star Wars, and you should take it as such. There's no ambiguity or confusion, and you know exactly what you're looking at and you understand it immediately, almost subconsciously. Now, let's compare that to Star Trek. I believe I have a fairly accurate number of how many Twitter accounts Star Trek is currently using, but it's almost too convoluted to know for sure, so do not quote me on this number. From what I can tell, Star Trek, as of right now, has three Twitter accounts. The main Trek account, Trek on CBS All Access, and the Star Trek Discovery on Netflix accounts. And you also need to factor in the dozen or so Amazon Prime and Netflix International accounts that share out Star Trek information kind of at random. The main Trek account and the CBS All Access Trek account seem to be the only ones regularly updated with information, but the cohesion kind of ends there. The Netflix one hasn't been updated since April of 2019, and its pinned comment is that of a geolocked video that not everyone can view. There is no cohesion between bio photos, headers, or any information being released. It's not even clear why there's a CBS All Access account at all, considering current and future Star Treks will all now be located there. The international Amazon Prime and Netflix accounts are sporadic with their information and are obviously not connected to the social media plans of the other two Trek accounts, which was exemplified during SDCC 2019 when the Amazon Prime Singapore account shared out the Picard trailer before it had even aired in the convention hall. Now let's slide on over to YouTube. Star Trek appears to be spread between two different YouTube channels, the CBS All Access's channel and the Star Trek channel. However, once again, there is no cohesion or clear communication strategy. The Star Trek channel doesn't even have the Picard or Discovery Season 3 trailers uploaded on their account. The two aren't linked at 
all through the featured channel section and instead point to other CBS based productions. Even this Facebook link doesn't take you to the correct location as it pulls up the CBS All Access version instead of the official Star Trek Facebook group. Now you might be saying to yourself, hey, just because Lucasfilm is doing it that way doesn't make what CBS is doing bad. And to that, I would simply ask, if you wanted to get an official update from Star Trek and from Star Wars, which set of social media programs would be easier to understand and trust? So with the website and social media products in a bit of a mess, how does Star Trek communicate with people online? Well, the answer is not very well and not very often. Very basic information isn't being passed on to Trekkies, which is causing a massive amount of confusion and frustration within the fan base. For instance, when are the new short treks going to be released internationally? Is Discovery moving off of Netflix to Amazon Prime? Is the new Picard comic overriding the 2009 Countdown comic? What's going on with the showrunner position for Picard Season 2? Are the animated shorts considered canon? I could go on and on, but you get the point. These are not hard questions that require a lot of deep thought. And it's not like we even need a definitive answer on anything. Simply acknowledging the questions and letting people know you're working things goes a long way. And yes, in the past, Star Trek hasn't done this kind of communication. But this isn't 2005, it's 2020. Social media does have its benefits, and it's time for them to start using it correctly to connect with old and new Trekkies. So how can they fix this? Well, honestly, it's pretty simple. Drop the ads from StarTrek.com, standardize the bio and header images across all social media accounts, keep all social media accounts updated regularly, consolidate these social accounts. I know this is kind of the opposite of what Star Wars does, but because you're dealing with so many international accounts from Netflix and Amazon, it's best to just have a singularly focused primary Star Trek account for people to use and to go and reference. Work with Amazon and Netflix on those aforementioned international accounts and maintain a cohesive uploaded update schedule across all platforms that you are able to control. That some of these disjointed efforts were sh for sure caused by the licensing being split up between CBS and Viacom. But these companies are now officially remerged. So now is the time to clean up the communication plan and the online presence of this franchise. All right, that's enough about communication. Now it's time to talk about development roadmaps. This is, again, something Disney does very well. Take a look here at the roadmaps released for Star Wars and Marvel. Clear, concise information to get people aware of what is coming and when. Even if the information changes, these kinds of graphics are so useful for people to keep track of things and are insanely easy to share out on social media. Star Trek has five shows and one film in various stages of production. Discovery, Picard, Lower Decks, Section 31, the Nickelodeon cartoon, and now Star Trek Kelvin 4. Let's go ahead and pull up their development roadmap. Oh yeah, that's right. There isn't one. Here, I'll make one for you guys. See? It's not so hard. Again, this isn't to say what Disney is doing is the only way to handle this kind of thing. But having something is really necessary in this day and age. I cannot tell you how many comments I get about release dates and confusion regarding when things are coming out because all of the information is so scattered all over the place. And you can forget about trying to figure it out through Star Trek social media platforms. So how can they fix this? Again, very simply, put out some kind of development roadmap for people to keep an eye on so they don't have to go hunting around for the information and it can also act as a quick reference guide for people to use so they know when the next production will be coming out. It just helps with the brand, it helps with keeping things streamlined, and it helps keeping people aware of when to tune in next. We arrive now at our final topic, brand expansion. <laughs> At this point, I think I've beaten the whole Disney does it better horse sufficiently, so let's just skip right into my thoughts regarding some improvements. My fixes break out into three ideas. Merchandising, conventions, and video gaming. Let's look at some merchandising stuff. So I think it's pretty obvious that Star Trek hasn't produced toys or tie-in merchandise for Discovery all that much, especially in comparison to the previous iterations of the franchise. 
But it kind of makes sense when you consider the adult nature of that show. I mean, it's got implied sexual assault, decapitated babies, eating humans for fun, and people getting murdered in horrific ways. <laughs> But now, with the inclusion of the animated short treks and the two new animated series is coming up, it's clear stewardship of the brand expansion for merchandise needs to pick up the pace. These cute Dot 7s and now the kid-friendly Tardigrade should have had tie-in merchandise released with the short. It's not like they didn't know the characters weren't coming, and Christmas is literally around the corner. Not timing this together just speaks to the lack of cohesion between the productions and the brand itself. I mean, hell, young Michael Burnham is literally holding a tardigrade plush in one of the animations, something that kids and adults alike would enjoy having or giving as a gift. The point here is they could be doing more to meet the demand that they themselves are creating with their own products. As for conventions, it's a pretty simple fix. You gotta ditch some of those privately funded ones, including Star Trek Las Vegas, and focus on putting together their own official Star Trek convention. Yes, just like Star Wars Celebration. It's a great way to connect with fans, showcase things from various productions, sell some of that merchandise I was just talking about, and drag actors out on a stage to answer questions and talk to people. Finally, for video gaming, this is another simple fix. As of right now, the most popular game for the franchise is the aging Star Trek Online MMORPG. In recent years, we have seen an influx of money-grubbing mobile games and that really weird VR Star Trek Bridge Crew game, but that's about it. Video gaming is a multi-billion dollar industry, something that most corporations are acutely aware of and have consistently produced video games to capitalize on that market. For whatever reason, Star Trek has kept a distance from video gaming, despite having a long history of pumping out games for decades. To fix this, Star Trek needs a new standalone RPG game one that focuses on a great single-player story and allows for a universe of exploration. They should also spend a few dollars to remaster some of the classics, like Voyager Elite Force and Star Trek Armada. It also wouldn't hurt to connect with a company like Creative Assembly to build a new Star Trek RTS or 4X video game for the strategy fanatics out there. The popularity alone of Star Trek New Horizons and Star Trek Armada 3 mods clearly show there is a market demand for something like this. This video is totally meant at an attempt of constructive criticism, pointing out some of the things you guys could be doing better and providing some possible solutions to those issues. There are a bunch of different ways to skin this cat, and I'm sure many of you probably have your own ideas, but these are mine. You know, these are my suggestions. But the bottom line here is Star Trek is in desperate need of proper franchise stewardship to help keep it relevant in today's world capitalize on the IP itself and expand the brand moving forward into the future.